And catch. Yeah, right there. Okay. Got it. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys, let's get started. They got me mic'd for some reason so we can record it. So, you got such a big group. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. School will be available. We don't have to secretly record you. And yeah, yeah. You. Well, and I'll, I'll probably forget stuff, so that's okay, too. Um, so what I want to do is I want to just spend a few moments getting to know each one of you. We're a small group, so we have time to do that. And so what I want to do is I just want to go around the room, and, I, and, and Brian, you're, you're going to be first, but uh, just share your name, where you're from, um, the church you're at, and one notable thing about the community you live in. So you're, you're up. All right. Uh, my name is Brian Rice, originally from Massachusetts. I am now at Joyce Bible Church in Joyce, Washington, it's on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, way out in the corner. And one notable thing about the community, man, I know it's vlogging was their industry. Nice. It's good industry. <laughs> yeah. Right here. Uh, my name is Cameron. I'm from Bremer, here. Uh, you're a very special person. There you go. Okay, nice. Um, right here, you just walked in, but what we're doing is we're, your name, where you're from, the church you're at, and something notable about your community uh, that you live uh, in. Todd, I'm at Northwood Chapel in Redding, Washington. Okay. Um, I guess notable, we were right on the border of the Joyce Bible Church, basically, on the border. Oh, wow. So nice. <laughs> we'll start in the back here. Nice. <laughs> right here. Uh, Jeffrey from Ocean Argonne Valley, Washington. Okay. Same. Same. Nice. Okay. How about? I'm Daniel Zilke. I'm a youth family student student here at Southern Alliance. Uh, another notable thing about Salem is we have a growing Latino population in the community. We're a yeah. starting to become a church. Nice. I'm Tim Bixby from Minden, Washington. Dallas and Wyoming is right on the border. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> right here. Uh, Randy Cook from Kodiak, Alaska. Kodiak oh, Bible I skipped you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Randy. Sorry. Uh, Kodiak Bible Chapel is the name of our church. Um, we're, we're on an island, and our community is about 6,000 people. It's extremely transient. Very few people in our community are from there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if somebody sticks around for a few years, that's uh, a tremendous blessing to the church. Uh, we're isolated. There's, uh, you can only get to our community by boat or by plane, so it's a very unique place. Nice. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, Adam and Danielle, we also live in Minden, and we serve with these guys. Okay. Uh, at one point, 
point, Linden had the most purchase per capita in the U.S. And uh, we've doubled the size in the last 20 years with people, and we haven't added hardly any people. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you got something to do. Yes. Nice. Are you planting? No. Okay. Just, just expanding. Yeah. All right. All right. Did I miss anyone? Right here. Okay. Uh, Caldwell is uh, is my region town, probably the least diverse. Um, but we have Dave, Van Sweet, Dan Morgan. Mm-hmm. That's right. Pretty diverse. Diverse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. My name is Bill Kreitzberg. I am the pastor of New Ground Alliance Church in Clarkston, Washington. Um, we just planted in 2018. Um, and one notable thing about our community, the LC Valley, I'll share a few. Um, first of all, we make like two of the primary essential things needed for life. We have clear water paper that makes toilet paper. It's important. <laughs> Through the pandemic, some of you probably still have some from, you know, 2020. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> And, and we have through a Vista, uh, Vista Outdoors, we make bullets. So, you know, we're, we're set. We're set. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm from. And I just want to welcome you guys to Innovations in a Rural Church. Um, kind of the first thing I want to I say is, is um, I'm not an expert in this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm going, I'm in the trenches with you guys. I'm making mistakes. I'm banging my head on stuff. So my hope here is not so much to be able to tell you all the amazing new things, but hopefully just encourage you and maybe give you some ideas that might point you in the direction where God's uh, leading you in being effective in your community. So, But before I do that, I want to address something that maybe all of you guys are feeling. Um, if you're in a rural church, you're probably in a smaller church. If you're in a smaller church in a less populated area, and when you come to district conference, you have a tendency to feel inferior or even like you are failing. Did I hit a chord? How about when the, the, the gal talking about multi-generational church stood up and said, we need to have all of our generations represented in our church. And how many of you went, okay, we need children's ministry, youth ministry, young adults ministry, college ministry, tweeners, empty nesters, senior adults, right? And the best you can do right now is some small groups and a Sunday morning service, and that covers most of your people anyway. So it's easy to kind of fall into that trap to think that, well, maybe, maybe I'm not doing as good as Salem Alliance, which has got, I, I, I bet you they don't even know how many ministers they have. They probably have some they don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've got a health clinic for crying out loud, which is awesome. But I have a question. If this church were in your community, would it be what it is? Honestly. Honestly. Probably not. Um, I, there, w- last, last Yesterday at, at our last session, we had a gentleman here, and he said, what, I, what I'm thinking, is he's like, well, it would probably be smaller than my church. And I would agree. And here's why. Because God didn't call this church to be in your community. He called your church to be in your community. And if you're leading that church, he called you to lead that church. And so that makes you the absolute best people to bring the gospel into your community and you the best pastor to lead that church. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I hope hope you're encouraging. You know what that means, though? That you're in your church, your church body, and you and your church body are the best people to bring the gospel into your community. And that means... You do it by being you. Not by necessarily trying to transplant something that you see somewhere else into your community because, man, it seems like a great idea. (laughs) 
it, it's okay to be small, right? I mean, that little dog is cute. It's okay to be small. It's okay to not have every ministry that you hear about in the, in the other churches. But we do, we do what we can to be effective in our community. Because that's our goal, right? Our goal is to bring the gospel into our community. We want, we want to be effective. So in this breakout, I want to encourage you to look at the community you're in, your community, your church, and your church to determine innovative ways to have an impact in your community and ultimately into the world. Um, there's a section of scripture that when I was in the middle of planting new ground, um, <coughs> I came across, and I'll tell you the story here in a minute, but I left Cross Point Alliance, which was a large church. It was a comfortable church. I was well grounded there. Like I'd been in that church since 96. I came on staff there. Everybody liked me. If they were to try to absolve my position or something, there'd be mutiny. So I was safe. <laughs> I'm saying that to be funny, not serious. <laughs> but I, I mean, I had, I had it, it, it going on, but God had called me to plant a church and I was finding a discontentment in what I shouldn't have been discontent with. But I, I, I knew that God had plant, called me to plant this church. I went through the process, and we were released on Christmas Eve. My last day was Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve service, um, and to plant the church. So Christmas Eve 2017, last day, January 1st, 2018, my first day as the church planter of New Ground Alliance, and I was terrified. What am I going to do? How am I going to accomplish this? And... And in my mind, there was all kinds of things that were going to stop me. And, well, because when, when you're in the process of church planting, you don't have to be at church every Sunday. You don't have to preach, you know, because there's no church to have church at. So have a little bit of flexibility. <coughs> so in that, I um, took the opportunity to fly to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and visit my daughter and son-in-law. My son-in-law is in the Navy. And... Uh, we attended their church and the youth pastor was preaching on this text i do not remember his application i just remember him reading this text and god saying bill this is your life scripture in this season okay and so this is what it says <coughs> it's a uh, um luke chapter 5 verse 17 through 20 luke 5 17 through 20 i'm sorry i didn't give you that in advance but it's on the board this is what it says. <coughs> One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus' feet. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When, he saw, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Jesus, or he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Okay, now, this scripture in, in that moment when I was sitting there in, in church not listening to the sermon, but just pondering on this, this scripture that this guy read, um, <coughs> I thought to myself, there's a group of people here, and they're referred to as some men. They don't have names. They don't have uh, faces. They're just some men. We don't even know how many they were. We, we assume that it's at least four, you know, because we assume that one man on each corner of the map, but that we'd have to say more because how would four guys, one on each corner, get him up on the roof, dig a hole in the roof and drop him down? So we, it seems like there's a relatively good-sized group of people that had contrived a mission and vision. And, and their mission was easy. 
Get our friend to Jesus. This guy needs Jesus. Who's in your community that needs Jesus? <laughs> right? I mean, that's why, you're, that's why you're a church. That's why you exist in your community, because there's people in your community that need Jesus. If there wasn't people in your community that, that, did, that didn't need Jesus, well, I guess well, there would still be a church, but we wouldn't definitely, our mission would certainly look a lot differently, wouldn't it? We would be trying to get people out of that community into other communities. But, um, so they had this mission and vision, and they, the first thing that happened, if you think about it, okay, there's this guy laying over here, he's a quadriplegic, and we want to get him to Jesus. Okay, the first thing they encounter is barriers. And there's a couple of, ba there, there's a couple of barriers, and I've kind of categorized them. And, and, and so the first one is, is the how or mechanical barriers. And th this one's not as obvious, but it's there, and you can see it, because the guy can't walk. He can't get there on his own. Why? Because he's a quadriplegic. That's kind of why they wanted to get him there. Um, so we have the, uh, the how. How can we do this barrier? How? How do we do it? You, you guys are thinking of that probably all the time in, in how to do ministry. Or, or maybe a different way of looking at it is to say, what do we need to get this guy to Jesus? And, and what, here's the thing. What is this? Resources. How much of your thought is, is centered around finances and volunteers to accomplish your mission? It's a pretty common thing, right? And so we see these barriers, this barrier, the how can. Of course, for them, it's like, okay, hey, you, you, and you, grab a corner, and, and, and w let's, let's all go, right? And so they, they, they overcame that barrier relatively quickly, okay? Now, um, but then there's the next barrier, and I think this is probably the most, ex the most uh, discouraging barrier that we face today, and th that's because it's people. People. <laughs> right? It, so they come to the house, and they know Jesus is in there. Perhaps they can hear him speaking, or they've heard from a great deal of people he's in there. The, cra the crowd's there because he's there. They know he's there, and there's a group of people who are in their way. And these are not non-believing people. These are Christians. These are church people that are in the way. These are people that are trying to get to see Jesus to accomplish a similar mission. You know, we heard last night that Martha was, was complaining about Mary but if we understand that correctly, then sitting and listening to Jesus teach was a good thing. These people were not doing a bad thing, but they had become a barrier. But then we see then there's a conflict of missions there. One is saying, I want to learn from Jesus. The other is saying, I want to get my friend to Jesus, to equally valid purposes but one was conflicting with the other, and it created a barrier. And so we have, comp we have this conflict or these competing values. And I would say this is the most discouraging. Is anybody here discouraged by their people today? It's okay. My first church, my people discouraged me desperately. But it caused me to pray way more than I do now. <laughs> and call other people to pray for me. <laughs> but here's the thing. <sighs> Barriers are signs to help you find avenues. Barriers are signs to help you find avenues. They're not meant to stop you. Often, God allows barriers in your path when you're trying to do ministry to direct you onto the avenue that he wants you to go on. And if you begin, when you begin to look at barriers as avenues, then you can answer this question. What tradition, individual, or group do you need to navigate, perhaps work with, or you know, have a discussion seeking understanding with, Okay, or 
perhaps even get around or join in with to accomplish your mission. One thing I don't want you to do, and I hope you guys get this, and, ho- I, and I, I think it was pretty clear, pretty clear this morning in, in our teaching, was it, that our people were not there to stop us. They're not there to stop us. Sometimes they can be nasty, though. Sometimes they can be the rose with a lot of thorns. We've experienced that. But they really do have the common purpose. It's just us sometimes taking the time to figure out how to navigate that and to see that barrier that perhaps they're, they're creating as a way to find the avenue that we need that perhaps God is, is, uh, <coughs> is uh, directing us towards. But sometimes we, we tend to get discouraged and give up and then we miss it. I've done that, and I, I gave up. I missed it. I walked away from a church, and uh, it took me a long time to heal from that. So, um, like the innovative friends, we need to discover the barriers and avenues of our community in order to find how we can be effective in that community, Okay. And so what I have is some questions, and these are questions that I asked of Clarkson, Washington, when I was preparing the plant. And as an elder board this year, we found ourselves asking the same questions again because what we're noticing is our community is changing rapidly. And so we want to be in, in the front of it. So we're like, we're like kind of not necessarily starting the plant over again, but we're, we're rethinking just kind of our strategy right now. And so there's here's some questions that, that, that you can ask and it'll hopefully help you um, kind of find effectiveness in your community. And the first question is, is who lives in my community? Who lives in my community? Um, I need a victim. Um, right here. Who lives in your community? Okay. Okay. And then we have Navy that's just down the road in Bremerton. Okay. Young Navy. So you've got young Navy families, retirement, and then tourists. Tourists. tourists okay. And they're popping in. Okay. Okay. Do they tithe while they're there? <laughs> if I, I have no idea. Oh, you just need to tell them, hey, if you're coming to visit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. One more. Uh, OMAC. What's your, who lives in your community? Okay. Wow, okay. And then the rest, white guys. Okay. Okay. Are you experiencing like some of the logging towns that have closed down? The meth, being the, the, uh, have you experienced that in your town? Methamphetamines. Yeah. Well, it's just that, like some of the towns, at least in Idaho, when when the mill closed and everybody moved away, the 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 bulk of those who were there were addicted, str- you know, struggling, and it, it really affected the town. That's why I ask. It's just as a Way to look at it. Okay. Yeah. So those are things that we want to look at. We want to look at ethnic background. We want to look at are they are these folks retired? Are these folks unemployed? Are they disabled? Are they addicted? You know, who lives in my community? Are they you know are they uh, young adults, college students? I mean. There is a plethora of different types of people that that we could have in our community. At Newground, um, originally when we set, when we set out to plant a church in Clarkston, I was thinking, okay, we're going to plant downtown. We're going to do celebrate recovery because addiction is is a, is a problem there, and and so our church is just going to kind of be like the the celebrate recovery church and. 
and um, we started moving in that direction and <coughs> in the process of looking at the town we started yard sailing in town so we just started checking out the yard sales going in and we did get some good deals um, and then we found a lot, saw a lot of junk but that's okay but our purpose wasn't necessarily get good deals but it was to meet the people and then also we started looking for a house and and there was something that we discovered that was happening in the heart the heights slash Vineland area of Clarkston and it's this um, for years that had been retirement you know 55 plus community there was actually some communities there where you had to be 55 or older to even live there but then that was probably only about 10 percent of the area and then the rest was just was just you know it's in the county it's not in in the city limits and and they just people just built houses out there um, and what what we discovered was this was the retire the people that had bought houses there in the 80s and 90s were now transitioning out of home ownership into you know assisted living nursing homes and and a lot of them the houses were literally being sold by their surviving children and what we discovered was is it wasn't elderly folks or older people that were buying these houses it was young families because you could get a really great deal on a really good house it was a house that was kept up the, r the roof was taken care of maintenance was done it was just really outdated like when I bought my house up there it was peach and it had peach carpet and the blue flamingos on the in the kitchen it, but we got a great deal on it I mean right now if, you, if I told you how much I paid for my house in 2000 18 you would be like holy smokes how'd you get such a screaming deal it's not <laughs> but we we it was a great deal because as soon as we moved in we had equity and so these young families are seeing these opportunities in these houses and they're jumping on them so there was a transition happened from the perhaps the 55 plus to um, moms and dads with grade school age kids and so what we decided was was who lives in our our community was young families that was the section of the community we were going to focus on and um, because we thought okay I'm, a, I'm an empty nester the empty nesters are going to relate to me and want to come and hear about my grandchildren right um, my the the grandmas and grandpas are going to come with their grandkids and so we're going to focus on we're going to focus on young families because that's who lived in our community and then from there we can do the recovery ministries once we establish ourselves okay and so um, the next question then is what are the needs of my community um, I did a follow-up question to clarify what I'm talking about because often if I say what are the needs of my community our minds go to the needy right what are the needs of my community well in Clarkston down by Walmart on Fair Street and the Motel 6 there is a lot of hurting people there's you know a lot of addicted folks a lot of mentally ill folks and just overall homeless lives down there on the levee there's some public restrooms that they uh, they fight over who gets to sleep you know the first person to get in there and lock the door gets to spend the night in the bathroom <laughs> um, is kind of the the thing and um, so there's that um, and and those are those are relevant needs but if my community is young families how do I get to their heart how do you get to a mom's heart how do you get to a dad's heart and so that's that's a little different spin on the question then isn't it is like how do I get to their heart well um, let me pick on someone I need a victim um, right here in the back how do you get to the heart of your community have you had have you figured out a way to do that Okay. Uh, the, the attorney not spoken up, giving up on them. 
Okay. Okay. So they just need to know you care. Okay. Awesome. One more in the back. Yeah, in your community. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is what we did. We, we're a church plant. There's like 30 of us, and we want to get to the heart of the families in our church. We, we rent the Grange Hall to have team meetings, which the Grange Hall is a scary <laughs> place. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the second oldest building in the, in the town. <laughs> Pretty dilapidated, but we could rent it. Yeah, it was $90 a year to use it. So I thought it was a good deal. Um, But anyway, we said, okay, what can we do? The Saturday before Easter, we can do an Easter egg hunt. And we can pull out all the stops. I was was a children's pastor at one time, and so I had all kinds of ideas. (laughs) And so we did this Easter egg hunt with like 2,000 Easter eggs. We had bouncy castles. We had free hot dogs. We had pop. We got the, the local bottling place, the Pepsi place, to give us all the free pop we wanted. All we had to do was put their sign on our tent. And we're like, oh, Pepsi, okay. <laughs> and uh, we had like 1,000 kids come. And we had this, uh, the paper came. We made it, we made like the front page of the Sunday morning, Easter morning paper and it, it, it was just it worked out great for us we didn't plan it that way we just want to do an easter egg hunt because we wanted moms to know that their kids mattered to us as well that was our point and we, if anybody asked us why we were doing it that's what we would say it's because your kids matter to us as much as they matter to you and so we we did that and that was a great introduction to our community but we wanted to continue that And so our second hire, obviously, as we began to move into having services later on in the year, we we hired a children's ministry director, someone that could just focus their attention on the kids and on the moms. It's like, focus on the moms. Pastor Bill, focus on the dads. I'll take them fishing. We'll have a blast. We'll take them to the range. We'll shoot, shoot, put some rounds down range. And uh, as things progressed, we moved into doing a trunk or treat. So on Halloween, they could come and trunk or treat the church. Um, we we by then had rented an office building, and so they came to our office and they just trunk or treated us. Uh, 2020, Halloween 2020 was a really interesting year. I was really discouraged because we had to cancel some of our events that that had really shown the community matter. We were handing out popsicles to the kids at all the city events, right, and. Uh, I was really discouraged because, you know, October was coming, 2020, COVID, we're locked down, we can't do the trunk or treat, and uh, I got an email from Brotherhood Mutual saying that if we did a trunk or treat, they would insure us. I'm like, our insurance company's got our back on this deal, so I'm like, you know what, if they'll insure us, if you can go to Walmart and shop, you can go to our trunk or treat. We'll just follow all the rules. So we we gloved up, we masked up, we had a we had a, a we gave out like 300 masks <laughs> and hand sanitizers, and and we set all that up. I stood by that table. We you know and gave directions for you know social distancing and all that <coughs> stuff, and and we had. We had a thousand people come through our trunk or treat. You gave out candy too, right? Yeah, we gave out. No, we gave out. We gave out mask and hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> you would not believe the teary-eyed responses I got from moms and dads for doing that. They were like, Pastor Bill, 
thank you so much for doing this because I had I was preparing to tell my kids until I heard about your trunk or treat that they were not even leaving the house on Halloween but you're doing it here and we know the kids can get trick-or-treat candy as safe as possible we can come here the kids can get like 22 handfuls of candy so they were leaving with big old bags of candy I made sure they were full too and and they were able to do that on Halloween and go home rather than going door to door that's what the moms and dads were saying it's like thank you for making it so we didn't have to either fight with our kids to not go or go door to door and so that was just like this tremendous thank you from the community you know like our Facebook page just blew up with thank yous we we didn't hear any negative feedback whatsoever which I was expecting because we had traffic blacked up for two blocks each way in front of our church and we don't have we have a parking lot big enough for 30 cars and so <laughs> and it was full with trunks and so uh, um, but it it got to the hearts of the moms and dads when we have our services we release the kids to children's church halfway through the service every Sunday we call them up and pray for them um, every six Sundays a year we do what's called family Sunday that's this Sunday <laughs> thank you <laughs> I don't have to preach Sunday um, and it, it's basically our children's ministry department takes over the Sunday service and so this year this week they're 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 learning the genealogy of Jesus so the really boring topic is going to be brought to life with all the the predecessors or the what are they called ancestors of Jesus introducing themselves on Sunday morning some of it's the kids some of it's adults it's the children's ministry department taking over Sunday morning and that service other than Christmas and Easter family Sunday is our third highest attended services <laughs> they don't care if I preach but what we've done is we've been successful in getting to, to the heart of young families in our community unfortunately the age group of our kids is about a four-year window <laughs> and we have six graduating seniors two two junior hires and then everybody else is in preschool <laughs> but we've been effective in reaching that group um, just kind of one site one one kind of secondary question to ask on this especially when we're talking about outreach is how many of you guys hunt elk Bow, no, no elk hunters, no bow hunters. Okay, in, two, in, in uh, about 1998, my brother and I decided we were going to become bow hunters. We are going to hunt archery. And we were going to get elk. <coughs> we were going to get the big whoppity. And, um, you know, we'd watch the movies, you know, the hunting shows where Will Primos and these big shot guys go out and they just start blowing the bugle that they want to sell to you for $50 and the elk just come so we went out and we started trying to call in elk and we're we're walking 20 miles a day I started to become I started calling our our hikes Batan death marches and um, we're walking around and we're trying to call these elk and we learned a lot the first three years is if you want an elk to come to you you need to get in their path. If, if they're walking away from you and you start calling them, they might call back to you, but chances are they're going to keep going the direction they were already going. But if you get in the place where they are going before them and call, hopefully you're ready when they get there because they're going to be on top of you in just a very short period of time. And so I, as, as I was thinking about, okay, my hunting experience, I realized that in, in reaching into my community, I need to find times where I can get out in the community when they're already out. Because if I'm, <coughs> if I'm trying to call them out of their homes, then the response is going to be relatively limited, especially in the Elsie Valley because there's, there's, there's the rivers that keep our families very busy in, in entertaining themselves and then we have some pretty extensive athletic programs that keeps our families busy and so we want to be strategic in, in when we do our outreach events and um, how many guys okay 
do any of you live in a town where there's not a day or a weekend where there's something that's like significant to your town, right? What do you have? That, that something is not happening? Well, no, that, that like, a, like a day, like, like what's the name of your town? Joyce. Is there like Joyce days? Yeah. Yeah? The first, better, first weekend every August. Okay, first weekend every August is Joyce days. So that's when the community kind of comes out and does whatever, yeah. okay? Do, do, do any of you have a town that it, 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 that doesn't have that? Pretty much every town has it. And pretty much most of the community, because it's probably been pretty consistent, already comes out. And so you can capitalize on that to, to be in your community to reach them. Um, a lot of towns have parades. Often it's in the summer. Water bottles are good. Otter pops are delicious when it's hot, especially, you know, and, and depending on what you, who, you know, th who lives in your community is going to determine on how, what you do. But for us, it's, it's always been about the kids. And so we're always thinking of the kids. First day of school, backpacks with, and ice cream. You know, usually you can get them out for that. Um, so just being, thinking, uh, you know, if I'm going to reach into my community, Perhaps it's to consider how do I get in their path? How do I go where I'm already going? Okay. Um, <coughs> kind of a quick uh, follow-up to that is, um, is to look at, if you spend the time to ask these questions and really kind of look at your community, doing some yard sailing, do some walking, doing some just interacting in a variety of ways you may want to look to see if does your mission and vision fit the you know and values fit your community most of the time it's going to a mission and vision usually is you know acts 1 8 matthew 28 it's pretty clear but what do you, what do your values fit and, and and you know sometimes there's there's stated values but then there's also the values of your church body see that's one of those barriers right because if the values of your church body is to have a fifth Sunday sing and church on Sunday morning and you're wanting to reach out into your community, uh oh, there's one of those barriers where you need to find the avenue, right? And so that's that's beginning to look at the, the stated values. But I also would say the actual values, especially if you're coming into an established church, which um, God bless you if you're in an established church. Because sometimes these barriers can be really, really discouraging. You know, I, I did a, a recovery program in my first church. It was the Church of God in downtown Clarkston. And uh, the congregation, they call, we had a board meeting. And the board meeting was because those Celebrate Recovery people, <laughs> they're just using too much toilet paper, Pastor. <laughs> I mean, you're going to need to, like, because we're going through twice as much as we used to go through. And, it, you know, it's, it's expensive. You, yeah, yeah, in a town where it's made. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And some of them actually worked there. <laughs> so it, it, it was, it, and so you can see that actual values. And it's because the reality is, is my wife and I and my team that had joined us after I started at the church had that value. The congregation they didn't have it. They had a value. They loved the lost. They had a desire to reach people. They really did. They were wonderful Christian people. There was nothing wrong with them. The problem was, was I was not communicating the mission clearly, and I was not helping to shift the values in a way that aligned with what we were trying to do that fit our community. Because what had happened with that church, it had been in existence for 100 years, and the community had changed, but they didn't. And so they were struggling. Praise God, after I left, they hired a wonderful man that is turning that church around. And every time I drive by on Sunday and I see that church, I say, thank you for Shan. His name's Shan Prophet. Prophet. <laughs> he's not a prophet, but he ought to be. <laughs> but he's turning that church around, and they're actually beginning to make a difference in their community. But I couldn't do it because I was seeing barriers and not avenues. So 
That was the lesson. That was that humbling phase in my life. <laughs> okay, so we got our mission, visions, values, our vision cast, our people recognized, and let's say we become successful. This is my current problem. How can we effectively, how can we effectively disciple our community? How can, wait, good English, Bill. How can we effectively disciple my community? I guess it's your community, but your people are doing it together, so I guess it works. How can we effectively disciple my community? Um, <coughs> I have a question, and you have to be honest. It's okay to be honest. Safe space. How many of you guys have do life groups in your church? Just one, two, three? Are they effective? Now they are. Awesome. For a long time, then it just happenstance. We didn't get anything going with it. Started, started working. Okay. Are they working in your church? Yeah. Well, yeah? No, Good. I, I was with a day in and day out. Okay. Okay. So is it men's and women's like small groups? Is that what you're doing? Well, that was the men's uh, Sunday morning for the men's church. Okay. And that's all we did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's working. Okay. What are the rest of you guys doing? What are you guys doing? Well, we, we tend to do it in dry groups now. Okay. Yeah. Which is, I think, what you were saying. Uh, what you had said is what we have done. We, we kind of tend to get people to the same place. Okay. Okay. We have Bible study and prayer time. And and then we started to we first went to meet with men and women. Mm -hmm. Which is more of a cultural but we have invited in people from all kinds of groups. Okay. And we have a men's dress rehearsal. Okay. We have a men's Bible study at six o'clock and two to twelve thirty. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's the third one that we've been doing. And so we try to get them in two groups. Yeah. It's not a it's not like a classical joint community group life together. It's kind of it's kind of mix match but it's even worse if it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you feel like it's working? Okay. Yeah, I do. I mean, in, in my heart of hearts, I'd like to see more community. Uh, but we have we have resistance to the more of a long-term, open, systematic type of a. <laughs> but uh, we also do our business at our own at our own natural pacing. Oh, okay. How many of you guys can relate with what he's saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I was an adult ministries pastor uh, in a church of a thousand before I was planted new ground. And in the Elsie Valley where my church currently is. And I took over for a guy who had kind of just beat his head against the wall for years and he was so broken he's like I just can't do it anymore and the church literally just kind of gave him a year to recover and so Bill the hero stepping in going to show everybody how to do it 
went to Leadership. Are you familiar? You guys familiar with Leadership? It's a training up in Post Falls, Idaho. Um, um, it's uh, if you've read Jim Putman's book, Church is a Team Sport. It's the classic Willow Creek life group model, and it's basically be a bully, make your people multiply, and and get it done. And we celebrated when we had 20% of our church in life groups. Because up until that, we were like 5, 10%. And, and I went in with like a bowl in a china closet, going to straighten this out. And you know what I left behind me? A wake of hurting people. So when I planted new ground, I'm like, i got to figure out what's going on in this valley because apparently what works in Post Falls, Idaho, and what worked for Willow Creek, and what worked for Saddleback, may not work for these people. Simply because, if you live in a small town, why did half of your people move to your town? Because they hate the people. Yeah, amen! I'm independent, I don't need anybody. Absolutely. Yeah, they, what people move to small towns to get away from other people. So they come to church and you say, I want you to be in a group of people. And you, they're like, why? Or you're in a small town, and they're fourth and fifth generation. Why do I need community? My grandparents are down the road. My parents are down the road. My siblings are here. And they're over there. Those are all my high school classmates. And you want me to be in community? I don't have time for it because I got too much community. So the question is, how are we going to disciple them? It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a time to be innovative, and I think what you're doing is knocking it out of the park. Absolutely. Yeah, good job, Adam and Danielle. But it's being, it's, it's in, in, in here, this is, this is probably my, the, the mistake I've made in my life, is trying to take, like, something, a box, and then forcing it and trying to make my people fit in it. And they're not cookies. They don't then come from a cookie cutter. They're individuals, and they have their own values and ideas, and they have their ways that they connect. And so at Newground, this is what we've been, this is kind of where we've been going, okay, is this is what we talk about at Newground, is we want you to connect with other believers in your life somehow. And there's different ways you can, con can connect. First of all, you can connect on the front porch. What's the front porch? Well, that's an all-inclusive gathering that is safe because it's not very intimate. You can just be as open as you want to be, right? Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm Ralph. Hey, I'm Bill. What do you do? I'm a pastor. What do you do? I work at Clearwater Paper. Awesome. That's all you want to tell me? Yep. Okay. Right? I mean, that's the thing. But then they might open up a little bit and so we have at Newground we are focusing right now on the front porch we have all of our groups are pretty much front porch groups what that means is they are inclusive we have we have very few exclusive groups we have a few life groups that are kind of continuing but rather than saying well you guys got to multiply we got to get more leaders because and because that's when the wake of hurting people is left behind is when you're just forcing that I remember Jim Putman us asking him up at Post Falls about how you do it. And he's like, sometimes you have to be a bully. Really? Okay. Of course, I ate that up. And I went in, I put my football helmet on, and I went to these life groups to let them know the vision and why they got to do it. And, and they're like, but I'm just getting to know these people. And I finally opened up about my struggle with pornography to my, the men in my group. And now you tell me I have to leave that group. Ouch. There's no amen on that one. It's just ouch, right? And so we, you know, we got to try to find a way to love our people and help them connect. And so the front porch. So, so we have, we have we, last last Saturday we had the, 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 an ATV ride. Anybody that wanted to come, go. We rode down to the Salmon River and we just had we had hot dogs and we hung out and we shot guns and some guys went fishing. One guy caught a pretty nice bass and I'm like, man, I forgot my tackle box. That was sad, um, but we just had a great time. We have sh men's breakfast with shooting, and we have, uh, coming up, we have a men's fishing day. The women are having an if gathering, <coughs> if you're familiar with that is. Um, we've got, uh, <coughs> okay, 
last mo- the Monday before last, I hear some ruckus downstairs. I'm like, what is going on down there? And I needed a cup of coffee, and that's where the coffee is. So I go downstairs in our building, and there's a barricade be- in the middle of the hall into the fellowship hall in our church. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. And I had to go over it. But what it, th- there was like, I don't know, eight or ten moms with their kids. And so there was a whole pile of kids. And so they, they, they built a barricade to keep them in the room with them. And they were just there. They were fellowshipping and praying for one another. I walked in there and I'm like, praise God, you guys. I am so glad you're doing this right now. And they're like, what are we doing? I'm like, you're on the front porch. You're praying together. And you're supporting one another and your kids are having a blast. If they break something, I don't care. We'll, we'll buy a new one. You know? And, and it's that, that, that front porch type thing. So we've been, si- with th- through the summer, we said we're going to focus on the front porch. Because I don't think you can move beyond, beyond that unless you have spent some time on it. In those inclusive groups, getting to know people. And through COVID, we're disconnected. How many of you guys would say your church right now is disconnected? And so we got to get reconnected, right? And so we're doing the front porch. The, the next uh, environment, you know, uh, connect, way to connect would be on the, in the backyard. Now, if you invite someone to your backyard, they're, they're invited, right? It's an exclusive group. And it's, <coughs> it's not as safe because there's an intentionality there to kind of go deep, to kind of start asking some questions. So it takes some time to get deep, right? Like in the small group, life group environment, um, because they're asking you to like, you know, we do rooted in, in at new ground. We've done it a couple of times, and and so when we do those those backyard groups, we do rooted, and so we're trying to get them down deep as fast as possible and get them rooted, right? Um, and so uh, there's that group, and that's been relatively effective for us, but probably not as effective as the front porch. But there's another environment that I'm seeing, kind of spontaneously develop, and 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 I think it's. It's becoming a more effective group, but it's not controllable. <laughs> and, and we don't like to, we want to control, right? But it's, it's, it's what we're calling the coffee shop. It's one-on-one or triads. Um, we did a, last year we did our men's fishing day, and Larry and, and uh, Rick met. And Larry's a pretty young Christian. He's just trying to figure it out. And Rick's been a Christian forever. You know, he's one of those guys who's been around the chur- church forever, loves to serve, loves to connect. They moved up from California a few years ago, and um, <coughs> they happened to get in the same boat fishing together. They, they kind of hit it off. Larry had never really been fishing before, and he loved it. So Rick said, hey, I'll start taking you fishing all the time if you want to go this summer. And so they were going every week. So here's Larry, this new Christian, being discipled by Rick while they're out fishing. I didn't plan that. God did. And those are great environments. But you know what? Even though I didn't plan it, you know what I can do? I can celebrate it and I can encourage it. I can celebrate and I can encourage it. I can stand on the pulpit and say, hey, you know, Larry and Rick, you guys, you guys must be having a blast out there. And we have the New Ground Challenge. This is a New Ground Challenge. Invite someone to lunch after church. If you're not super comfortable with that, invite someone you know and someone you don't know. But invite somebody out for lunch. If you don't want to have them over, go to a restaurant. They're safe spaces. Is it restaurants? Yeah, we have restaurants. <laughs> yeah, technically, we, we kind of sort of qualify as a rural church um, because the community I'm in, would, we would consider that rural because we're kind of like, we're kind of rebellious against the rest of the valley. Um, <laughs> Because we, we really don't have anything in our community. We have to go to downtown or to Lewiston. But, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we actually have Costco and Walmart, and they're next to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't belong. I'm sorry. I don't belong. <laughs> I, that's what I asked Micah when he invited me. I'm like, rural? We, we are rural, though, compared to this place, right? And I'm a redneck, so they figured it would work. Um, <coughs> so, so how, you know, th- those are some things that begin to, and, and I hope that in this discussion, like, of, I can, 
rip the sides off the box and you begin to look at your community instead of Google for how you're going to disciple your people. And I hope that as you think about it and you kind of come up with a way, you're not ashamed because it's not what everybody else is doing. Because it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if our church is like more established, mm -hmm. uh, how do we know, how do I know if I'm a barrier or if I, if we'll try to find the other barriers? Okay, if you're the barrier? Like if I just haven't changed with the community. Oh, that's a good question. Like Linden has churches that are 70, 80, 100 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, ours is old 20 maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are new people coming? Are they staying? Do they feel like they can belong when they come to your church? That's kind of what I look for. Yeah. You know, if they've been there three or four times, I want to talk to them and find out what they think. If they've been there once, then maybe they found out that I'm too much of a redneck and they want to go to the educated guy, <laughs> the more scholarly guy. <laughs> Most of my illustrations are based upon chainsaws, so. Um, <laughs> on a side note, okay, I decided when I went in to Clarkston that I didn't want to only see um, church people. For years I'd done automotive repair on the side because I was a mechanic for a lot of years. This doesn't crawl under cars anymore. It's too old and broken down, and I don't sleep for two days when I do, like trying to get a transmission in like that. When I was young, I could do it. So I started fixing chainsaws. So how I started was I bought some broken chainsaws, restored them, and listed them on Facebook Marketplace, met some people, said, any problems, bring it back. I'll fix it for you. Free labor, minimal parts. Pete... Jeremy, Cole, uh, George, um, who's the other guy? There's probably eight, ten, oh, Lemoy. There's like eight or ten guys that come to my house all the time. And we don't just fix their chainsaw because I say, I got the parts right now. I can do it for you right now while we visit. And we... We talk about stuff. It helps me get to know. And they say, why do you do this? Because I want to get to know you. I want to get to know people outside of my church. And George now, when he comes, he's like, I need you, Pastor Bill, to fix my chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's how I personally get out in the community because I want to have, I wanna be, have like some connection in my community. Yeah, and I do, I mean, they do pay me for their chainsaws, and sometimes I get a little parts labor from them, but I'm not in there trying to make a profit. I'm in there just trying to connect with them. And the one guy owns a tree service company, and so he's bringing me chainsaws, and his guys are bringing me chainsaws all the time. And uh, he loves it because it's cheap. <laughs> but his name is Jeremy, and right now um, I met... Um, another pastor that has connections with him and we're tag teaming Jeremy we're going to get this guy in in the kingdom so we're, we're working on it and the other guy planted at the same time I did but he planted a cowboy church which is that's really unique church <laughs> but uh we're working on Jeremy um and so uh, rough tumble guy that climbs trees you know he's 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 a rough tumble brave guy um Okay, so how do I effectively disciple my community? Hopefully that, th so all that to say, I hope that you're, that kind of gives you some encouragement and you don't go away seeing what other churches are doing, going home thinking, man, I'm blowing it because I'm not doing it like them. Go and do it like you because you're in your community by God's providence. Okay, okay.
Next thing. Did somebody have a question? Okay. How do we send people into new communities? Okay. Um, what do you guys think when I say that? What, do you, what comes to your mind when you hear me say that? How do I send people into new communities? Planting? Planting? Yeah. Well, if you're in a small town, your church is probably limited or your church size is probably consistent with your town size. If your town's not growing, your, town, your church is not growing, right? Or if it does, you're doing pretty well, but it's probably not going to grow exponentially. But we want to be a church that, we want to be a community, uh, we want our churches to further the kingdom beyond our walls. And so um, being strategic about how can I be praying about the town down the road that maybe there's people that need to hear the gospel. They're not going to drive here, so how can we go there? How can I raise up another pastor to plant another church? That's a two, three-year process, guys. Depending on where your, your person is, how do I, and, and, and equipping a team to go, um, beginning to think about that. Um, For me, I went in to plant new ground with the intention of planting more churches. That was my goal. I wanted to start church planting in our area because we're the first church plant, at least with the Alliance, in probably 70, 80 years. Uh, well, Warner was planted in like 69, so maybe not quite 70, 80 at 50 at least and uh, <coughs> I wanted there to be more and more and more um, but then as time went on I got to thinking oh well we got to get big because that's the goal of church right is to be a big church um, and then we started pricing out property and buildings and we had this 1.4 million dollar project that we thought we could do That was absurd. It was going to cost, you know, that's it. That's $10,000 a month payment plus insurance and utilities and all of that. And God just kind of said, Bill, I called you to plant churches, not become another big church in town. There's all, we already have those. We want something, you know, I want something different. And um, so we bought a small building cost us $700 a month so that we can plant another church. And so our, our strategy said, hey, you know what? We're, gonna, we're okay being small because we think we can be more effective if we're a bunch of small churches rather than trying to get big when it's going to be a fight to get big and it's going to be a fight to stay big. And maybe that's not what God has in the first place. Maybe it's God's desire for us to just reproduce because then when I get sick and die yeah my church might struggle but the churches we planted won't even miss me won't even notice and so you know beginning to ask how can I send people into new communities beginning to think about that posing that question to your elder board or your leadership board whatever you you operate how can I send people into new communities and and when I say that is and I say we that means it might look different than anything else hopefully you guys getting the idea here is that it's not so much a model that we've heard before and I need to wrap up because it's time for lunch um, how do we get there um, okay one last thing How many of you guys read this book, Old Paths, New Power? Monty, this, this, this winter, Monty did a promotion of it, and there was a book club that I think he did through Zoom. I, uh, I bought it and read it, and I made my elders, and then I went through it with my elders, because here's the thing. If you want to be innovative in your church, there's a statement in this book all too often, pastors go to Google before they go to God 
when they're trying to figure out how to lead their church. Ouch, but true. This book talks about ways to seek God on your own and with your team to reach your community. It's a good book. It changed my life. It changed how we do ministry at Newground. So I invite you to to grab that Old Paths, New Power by Daniel Henderson. Good book. Easy read. I mean, it's a thickish, but you can power through it. I, I mean, I'm dyslexic, and I powered through it in a week. So you can, those of you that aren't dyslexic can probably do it in the afternoon. So uh, any questions before we close? Because I know I'm getting hungry, and you guys probably are too. All right. Hey, thank you guys for coming to um, Rural Church Innovations. Have a blessed week, a blessed year, and I hope you guys go away from here encouraged. Let me pray before you go. Father God, I just thank you for these leaders. Lord, help them to see the avenues and to not be overwhelmed by the barriers. Help them to seek you first to find the avenues. Help them to to go to their people, to not fall into the trap of sometimes going against their people, but to go with their people and to lead their people. Bless them and encourage them. Give them the strength and the wisdom every morning to carry on one more day. And may you be glorified through them in their community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys and thank you for coming.